Thank you. Um, for the next 30 minutes or so here, what I would like to do is uh, share a story with you. And the story that I would like to share with you is one of Salesforce transformation. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about a fairly holistic uh, transformation, kind of an end-to-end -end change. Uh, the, kind of the reason behind my choosing this topic and focusing on it in this way at this time is that you know, too many of the points that Gerhard just make, a lot of change is happening in sales organizations. I think sell, many sales organizations are stepping back and trying to understand fundamentally how do they take their organization to the next level. And the driving forces behind that are somewhat company specific, but it will be things like major changes in the way our customers are buying, uh, major changes in the way in which we need to sell uh, and, and be able to create and communicate and prove and reinforce our differentiated value in the marketplace, uh, factors such as that. Um, now, while I'm going to talk about a kind of very comprehensive transformation story, my hope is that for those of you that are kind of in more of a continuous improvement mode, there's going to be some nuggets that will be valuable uh, to you as well. And I'm going to try to figure this out real quick, okay? Uh, so as we get into uh, this discussion about Salesforce transformation, I think maybe uh, give us a little bit of context. The uh, screen that I've just put up, uh, or the slide that I've just put up on the screen is a, a framework that we use. Uh, you may have other frameworks within your organization, but this framework for us uh, really helps to identify the key drivers of Salesforce effectiveness. And I'm not going to go through each and every element of this. You can kind of scan through it and get a sense for it. I have a couple of points that I'd like to make as you look at this framework. One is that you'll notice on the left-hand side, Salesforce effectiveness begins with the customer. Uh, begins with a very clear understanding of their needs, their buying processes, their buying preferences, uh, what they value, but also how valuable are they to us. Um, and then we have aspects of go-to-market strategy. We have all the detailed aspects of implementation. Uh, one of the things that tends to jump out at people when we start looking at frameworks like this is that boy, this is complex. And that's actually a in very interesting aspect of Salesforce. I think that uh, you know, one could make a very strong argument that Salesforce are actually one of the most complex functions in any business. There's at least 30 key drivers uh, that really substantially impact the effectiveness, the performance of a selling organization. It's not as easy as, well, let's kind of throw training at it and let's throw compensation at it, and, and those are areas that we get involved in. Those two alone don't tend to get us there. Complex uh, system. Um, and for many organizations, you know, the question becomes, what do we focus on and how aggressive do we try to be uh, in taking our selling organization to the next level? And really, if we look at two ends of a spectrum, there's sort of the continuous improvement end of a spectrum to Salesforce transformation. There's sort of a more uh, aggressive end-to-end uh, -end approach to Salesforce transformation. There's not one of those that's right or wrong. It's situation-specific. My guess is that 80 to 90% of you sitting in this room, your correct answer is continuous improvement. Uh, you're, you may not be in the space where you're going to, quote, blow up the sales force uh, and redesign it to take it to the next level. And one of my favorite uh, continuous improvement stories comes from uh, a sales leader I used to work with back in mid-90s. His name was Hank McCrory. And Hank, uh, at that time, was a leader of uh, Pfizer's sales force. And if you, uh, I don't work a lot in pharmaceutical, but if you know about the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the Pfizer in the mid-90s was the great white shark of pharma. If they came into your marketplace, this is a very bad thing. Uh, they were really good. And their sales force was always noted as the top sales force uh, in the industry. Uh, and what Hank did, I think, that was so special, he oversaw this group of six, 7,000 people. Uh, what he did was so special was he was able to celebrate the successes that they had had and create a culture that celebrates success. But at the same time, Pfizer remained and the Salesforce remained very dissatisfied with where they were. Here's the, here's the best Salesforce in the industry, maybe the, one of the best Salesforces in the world across any industry. Uh, yes, we celebrate our success, but we're also very dissatisfied 
with where we are. And what he did every year was the continuous improvement thing. He identified one or two things from that slide that I showed you a moment ago uh, that they needed to get substantially better at or had the opportunity to get substantially better at that would continue to improve their performance. And he did that year after year after year. So that's the continuous improvement idea. The, the story I'm going to share with you here in a moment, it's on the other end of the spectrum. It's transformation. And we tend to get into transformation when we have major changes in our marketplaces that cause us to make some change to our go-to-market strategy, uh, meaning that we need to make some change to the way that we're going to structure our value proposition strategy. So our value prop strategies change, or our sales process strategies change, or our uh, channels and sales force design change. Uh, when we change any one of those things, it creates a domino effect in our selling organization. If I change structure, well, that probably means I need to now realign the sizing of my sales force. I've got to realign the territories of my sales force. I might have to redesign incentive plans and goals. We tend to get into this transformational mode. And the case example I'll share with you is uh, more of that type. So this particular company was actually a market leader. Uh, which makes for an interesting case of why would they go through a transformation. Their situation is one that market leaders sometimes run into, and that is that uh, the, the gap that had made them a market leader in their technology had narrowed, and the customers had evolved. They were becoming more demanding. They wanted to know more about why you're really different and how does that actually translate into economic value for me. This particular company was in the plastics industry, and they made some very, very important parts that go into molding equipment uh, that ultimately gets used by companies like a P&G or a GM or others. So the, all the caps on your bottles, good chance these guys' equipment was involved in that. Or the dash in your car, uh, lots of different things. They had actually thought they were an extremely good sales force. And what they learned when that technology advantage diminished was that, hmm, maybe we're not an extremely good sales force. Uh, because the competitors were able to really close the share gap. Uh, and in fact, the company was at risk of not being the market leader anymore. Uh, the competitor self-source was more aggressive. They were better at uh, understanding customers' unique needs. They were better at taking, even though they had a slight technology disadvantage, taking their product and uh, developing a compelling value proposition. This was fairly motivating to them, uh, so they wanted to step back and figure out how do we change this. Their question was a question that many sales leaders run into, and that is, we know we need to grow faster than we're growing. We know we need to command better price premiums than we seem to be able to, to command today. What should we actually do? And so now that brings you back to that earlier framework. Boy, there's 30 or more things that I could choose to do. What do I actually do to move this organization forward? Um, one of the interesting factors that uh, was part of this dilemma was that at the very highest levels of the organization, the CEO and members of the board's perspective was that, hey, why are we overcomplicating this? This is pretty simple. Can't we just throw some training at it and, and kind of uh, change up the comp plan and we'll get there? And reality is training and compensation are both extremely important, but also highly insufficient in most cases to fundamentally transform the capability of a selling organization. Uh, these are probably the two most overused drivers of any of those 30 that I've shown you. That they're the two that sales leaders and sales leadership tend to jump to the quickest as, well, this is how we're going to fix this problem. And many times, very naively so. Important drivers, but usually not powerful enough to fundamentally change the growth trajectory of a selling organization. Um, and again, I say that knowing, I want to kind of put out there, these are areas we're very involved in, particularly the incentive side. Uh, but I think that probably the reasons that sales leaders tend to gravitate to these is that they're relatively non-disruptive. It's pretty easy to go train the sales force. You haven't restructured them, you haven't reorganized them, you didn't have to change territories, you didn't have to change the way that they sell all this stuff, it's pretty easy to change incentive plan. It's pretty, non, it's pretty uh, non-disruptive, but it also doesn't get the job done uh, most of the time. Where we started with them was we, we've got to actually learn and understand what the drivers are to sales force effectiveness and 
how they relate to our capabilities as an organization. We did a workout with them. Maybe some of you have done these in your organization. And the workout really took them through the modules. The kind of the cadence of that was, here's what best practice in today's world really looks like. What are you doing? And that process began to get us on the same page as to, hmm, it's a little more involved than training and comp. Uh, there's all of these other areas, and in fact, there's some strategy-oriented areas that probably we have issues in. So major breakthrough was kind of get us on a common platform of understanding and begin to recognize that this is more complex than these two simple drivers that our, our uh, executive team is thinking about. We arrived at, through a process, really uh, an, an understanding that there were three major opportunities for them. And, I, and I've picked this particular case because... Uh, I've probably been involved in 20 or 30 major transformations uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, and you, you know, after you've done that this many times, you start to see some patterns. Uh, one of the patterns that you start to see is that these three areas come up time and again. Uh, number one opportunity for this organization uh, was to improve coverage of their most valuable accounts. Okay, so as they began to look at what is the growth opportunity for us? And what are our capabilities relative to that growth opportunity? We quickly, quickly were able to recognize, hey, we're just simply not covering many of the most important accounts. Or we're not covering them very well. If we don't show up, we can't win. And if we don't show up with the right resource, we can't win. We've got to do better. Now, they had a few things going on that you might think about within your organization. Role pollution too little selling time. It's amazing how many sales forces drift over time. Their salespeople become almost service people. You could make a living out of doing nothing more than going around depolluting sales forces. Uh, because as that process happens, of course, the amount of time we're spending selling goes down. Uh, we're spending lots of time fighting fires. And the kind of the hidden uh, problem with that is that as my sales force becomes more of a, quote, service force, it tends to erode accountability of the sales force. Why does it do that? Because you can't hold me accountable to my goal anymore. I don't have time to do that. I've got to serve. Look at all the service stuff I've got to do. And in fact, many sales forces love doing the service stuff. It's a little easier. You get lots of kudos from the customer. Selling is much harder than servicing. So they had a lot of that going on, role pollution uh, that we had to deal with. Uh, they weren't covering all of the growth, key growth accounts. There was a huge segment of mid-market accounts they just weren't even getting to, partly because some, a lot of the salespeople loved to spend time in small accounts where they had developed relationships over a long period of time and had good friends. These were, these were great accounts, easy for them to call on. They didn't get their best talent on the most important accounts. You looked at their key accounts, their global accounts. They were somewhat evenly shared across geographic territories. Some geographic territories had a great salesperson in it, a person that actually had the skills and competencies to cover that kind of account. Others didn't. So it was very hit or miss, uh, the kind of people they had against the accounts. They had uh, heavy and light territories. They had territories that were two people's worth of workload. Well, what's going to happen there? We're not going to get to those, some of those accounts. They had territories that was half a person's worth of workload. What's going to happen there? We're going to get to all the accounts, but it's going to be a high cost of sales. Uh, because we've got an expensive salesperson there with only half a territory's worth of valuable workload. So that was sort of the first big aha, is we have a huge opportunity in that area uh, to improve our business performance. The second area that they had an opportunity was uh, the impact that they were having on their actual sales calls. It's great to show up. It's great to show up with the right resource. That's the starting point. But when we show up, we have to have impactful interactions. Uh, it can't be showing up and asking how things are going. Um, and so, uh, you know, they really needed to focus on a number of, of factors. Uh, they were really in the mode of, as engineers, here is all of the great aspects of our product. If you want to know about heat transfer, I'll talk heat transfer to you all day long. We can talk QDOT, this and that, uh, et cetera. So, that's what they loved. That was their genes. They weren't very good about talking about business needs and translating these 
technical features into business economics and work. And that was a real problem for them as the, as the buying processes in these companies evolved over time. The technical people on the customer side weren't the only decision makers anymore. In fact, their role in the decision process had diminished, uh, and so we had that. So we had, we had issues like that. We had issues such as uh, call planning. Uh, I think their sales force viewed call planning as, and account planning as administrative activities. Okay, so if I have to do call plans, that's an administrative activities. Uh, and what they hadn't recognized was that uh, call planning is selling. Maybe it's the most important part of selling. Because the reality is that what actually happens during the customer call, my time with the customer, is more of a consequence of how well I prepared for that interaction and how well I defined and prepared for the advances that I'm going to try to accomplish than it is some form of sales voodoo that I was just born with. Uh, and as we look at top performers, organization after organization after organization, we will see that those people tend to be more rigorous about their processes and spend disproportionately more time investing in their call planning and account planning because they've realized this causality. So this was a big issue here. And the last one was performance focus and accountability. They had become a fairly complacent sales force. Some of you might see some of this in your sales forces sometimes. So, uh, uh, you know, they really had gotten in an order-taking mode. They were pretty tolerant of top performers. If you have less than 5% turnover in your sales force, and I don't mean turnover of your top people, turnover of the bottom end of the ranks, you probably are being uh, very tolerant of low performers. Uh, top performing organizations actively are managing out the bottom group and trying to bring in better people. They had a lot of that going on. So the question becomes, great, they had a lot of problems, but you could also look at that as a lot of opportunities in those three areas. What do you do about it? And this is where it kind of comes back to the Salesforce technician again. We have drivers, we have levers that as sales leaders we can focus on to impact those, the kind of areas that I was just describing. This is kind of a complicated slide. I would never start with this with the board. Uh, we kind of start back on what's the growth opportunity and where are your gaps and capability to achieve that. That was the prior slide. But the reality is to address the things that we just talked about, it's not one thing that's going to get us there. We have a system of issues. If we talk about coverage, well, that's probably a segmentation, structure, sizing, and territory design issue. If we talk about impact with the sales or with the customer, well, that's a sales process, sales tools, training, coaching, maybe hiring uh, oriented issue. If we talk about uh, accountability and performance focus, that's, a, that's a, a culture, a metrics and incentives plans, a goals, and perhaps a, a reporting and dashboards oriented issue. And so given that they had all of those, uh, you see a fairly comprehensive approach. I've, uh, when, when I've gotten involved in uh, Salesforce transformations, this pattern is not uncommon, that this would be the set of things that we would address, and in the hierarchy, because there are strong interdependencies between the drivers. Uh, you know, we tend to need to start with the customer, and then we need to figure out uh, the downstream things around our strategy. In this case, it was structure and sizing, but there was also value prop and sales process. And that leads to a domino effect to the implementation elements that we need to ultimately focus on, like territory design and goal setting and some of those kinds of factors. I'm going to share with you now just a very uh, quick snapshot of a few of the things that they specifically did. Because, you know, my intent is to give you a flavor for what a transformation can look like and what the components can be. One of the places that they started was, as I described before, the customer. And they did a lot of work around the customer to understand needs and buying processes, but one of the things that they did very specifically that I see as a gap in so many organizations is that they brought some leading analytics, predictive modeling, uh, to be able to estimate growth opportunity down to the account level. What is the potential of our account universe, both existing customers but also prospects, uh, uh, for our business? And then what is the attractiveness of that, of that potential? Um, and so the granularity to be able to understand potential down to the account level is, a, is an amazingly powerful driver of sales effectiveness. Potential is the secret sauce to me, being able to size your Salesforce right, deploy your Salesforce right, set goals right, 
all of those kinds of fundamental factors that relate to coverage of the marketplace. If you don't have good measures of potential, I can almost assure you, you don't, aren't making optimal decisions on any of those things. Sales per rep is a terrible, terrible idea. Uh, and I'm not going to get into that because it would take me a while, but if you want to talk about why it's such a terrible idea, we can do that at the break. Just keep in mind, if you want to maximize sales per rep, fire your entire sales force except one person, uh, and you'll maximize sales per rep, at least for a while. Um, so uh, they estimated potential down, and they thought it would be impossible to do. And, and I hear that again. I'm trying to share some patterns with you that, you know, we don't have the data to figure out potential at the account level. I, there's been very few times when that was actually true. Uh, we're almost always able to, through their internal data, their internal sales history data, and external market data, bridge together data sets uh, that allow organizations to estimate and predict potential. And typically, you have to marry that with field force insight and input as well. Uh, and so they did that. And this granularity now allows them to understand you know, well, where, what regions uh, or geographies might there be growth opportunity? What accounts might there be growth opportunity? What's the nature of that growth opportunity? Is it about new account acquisition, or is it about more cross-selling or more solution selling or greater penetration, et cetera? And it's those insights then that give them the starting point to say, great, there's the growth opportunity. What actions do we now take to better pursue that? Okay, uh, so predictive modeling. They, I mentioned this idea of depollution. Uh, this is, is an area you might think about for your sales force. Uh, they spent a lot of time trying to understand how, what activities are our sales force engaged in today versus what would, do we think they should be engaged in and where are there activities that really others should be doing uh, or perhaps we shouldn't be doing at all. And a couple of the insights that they arrived at was that we're, our sales force is doing, as I mentioned earlier, way too much servicing. Be a little careful with that one, because it's never yes or no to should they be involved in servicing. It's what parts of the servicing role typically should they be involved in, and what parts should they not be involved in, and how do we manage that? Uh, there were, uh, so there were activities like that we didn't want them doing as much of. We wanted to decrease activities. They loved to go onto the shop floor and diddle-dally with these machines. They could do that all day long. That's where their, their joy and, and love was. We don't need them doing that. They weren't adding any value. If that actually needs to be done, there's technicians to do that. We need to decrease that activity. They had activities they weren't spending enough time on. Actually, the hard activities. Uh, their call planning, their account planning, their territory planning, their pipeline management. They weren't spending nearly enough time on those parts of the sales process to maximize their impact and effectiveness during the sales call. So uh, this idea of effort allocation and, and deep pollution uh, effort rationalization can be very important. We looked a lot at the top 20% of performers to kind of within their organization to understand what their effort allocation signature kind of looked like. How does that compare to the middle group? How does that compare to the bottom group? Uh, and that's one way in which you can go about establishing some proof points for what actually works uh, in the particular selling environment. They restructured. Uh, they, so one of the things they did was they gave up on the idea that everybody gets a geographic territory. They created key account strategic account team and they carved those accounts out and they gave them to the right people. We, read a, we, we went through a very careful process to understand what are the competencies actually required to manage those kinds of accounts, selling processes and buyers and who actually has those. Uh, and by doing that, they got right talent, best talent against most important accounts. That area of their business, so just doing that and improving the program, so the executive sponsorship of these uh, accounts and some other factors uh, translated into huge growth for them uh, because of the 2080 rule. If we can be a little bit more successful in that top 20% of accounts, that's big dollars. They uh, had had a field sales that uh, had covered everything. They got rid of that. They, the field sales organization now only covered mid-market. And the big challenge here is, how do I get the field sales to stop calling on those small accounts that they love? Uh, very hard to change that behavior. So the way in which they did it was they said, call on all the small accounts you want. But you're in a named account territory. You will only get credit for the accounts that are named to your territory, which, by the way, are mid-market accounts. If you call on the small accounts, 
that's okay. Uh, your inside sales brethren will love you because you're going to make them rich, uh, but not yourself. And they gave all the small accounts, as you might imagine, to the inside sales group, uh, which they piloted. The other big thing that they had to do was completely re-engineer back office project engineering. Uh, because they wanted to shift all that service work and all that technical work to this group. And in fact, uh, I see this sometimes, from a sizing point of view, they had had uh, a hypothesis that we need to significantly increase the size of our sales force. In their particular case, it was true. They needed to significantly increase the capacity of the sales force. But they were able to do it without increasing a single headcount uh, in sales. They shifted about 25% of the sales effort load over to this other group that they re-engineered. Keep in mind, if your sales force is wasting 10% of their time doing non-productive activities, that's like downsizing your sales force by 10%. Okay, so if we can free up 25% of their time, that's like increasing the sales force size by 25%. Uh, they realigned territories. I won't spend a lot of time here, uh, but they got the sizing right. Uh, they had territories that were 2x workload a person's capacity. And this, is, this slide relates to what I, I might describe as kind of the great white lie that exists in so many sales forces, and that is, uh, you know, are we covering so-and-so account? Yes, we're covering them. How do you know that? Because that account is assigned to Mike. Well, what if Mike is in a territory that has two times as many accounts as I can cover? Are we really covering that account? Mm, can't say so uh, in that situation. We might be, but we may not be covering it all, or we may be undercovering it. So this idea of are we covering the account has to be tied to the actual territory design. They took the heavy territories, and you can kind of conceptually imagine they shifted a bunch of that workload to the light territories, so that in each of the territories we actually have enough salesperson capacity to cover the accounts that are most valuable to us. Just this one activity is worth a huge amount, uh, because now we're able to actually have the right resource to get to the right accounts, hopefully at the right time. Uh, so those were some of the things they did around market coverage. Sales process is actually harder. I'll tell you that in the, of the three things we looked at earlier, getting better coverage of the market, having higher impact in our customer interactions, and achieving accountable performance-focused sales force, the hardest one of those three by far relates to better impact during the sales interaction. Because what we're really talking about is sales process, people knowledge and skills, and perhaps some of the tools that are supporting them. And that area is an area now where we're tending to fight very deeply entrenched beliefs and experiences that, that uh, mature sales forces have, and trying to change those beliefs and behaviors in a way that's going to be more successful in the future. Uh, real quick, what I found doesn't work. Top-down jams don't work too well. And what I mean by that is that you send a couple smart people away in a back room, they design an amazing sales process, they bring it out, they give it to training, training builds this great presentation around it, the entire sales force comes in, they get trained, they go back out into the field, and all of what happens? Nothing. Okay, they had a good time, very little change in behavior. And I can't tell you how many organizations I've worked with that are on sales process 2.0, sales process 3.0, sales process 4.0. There's nothing different about the sales processes fundamentally. They just keep trying this top-down jam and it's not getting them anywhere. And the reason it's not getting them anywhere is it's not fundamentally changing salespeople's understanding of how this is different than what I already do today. Most of them look at these sales processes and they say, yep, that's brilliant, that's exactly what I do today. Uh, so they don't recognize how it might be different than what they do today. And they don't necessarily believe that if I were to do that, assuming they recognize the difference, that I will be more successful. Keep in mind, I got skin in the game because I have this thing called a variable incentive plan. So until I believe that I'm going to be more successful doing it, you, you, you can mandate to me all you want uh, that I'm going to do it. I ultimately have to believe it. We uh, have tried some different things, and maybe you've tried some of this, early experience ideas, uh, or early experience team ideas. The basic idea here is co-design. And the basic idea here is to approach design and deployment of sales processes and tools in a way that has a better chance to build understanding of how it's different than what we do today and belief that it'll have more impact. And so the co-design idea is not piloting. Uh, this early experience team idea is not piloting. Piloting still leaves open the possibility that a small team, whoever built it, and now it's being handed over the fence to somebody to try. 
Co-design says bring in some of your best sales managers, your best sales people, co-design this thing. You might end up with exactly the same answer, but you have a group that's committed and engaged in it and actually go out and uh, test it and validate it with that team so that you end up with advocates who can talk at a peer-to-peer level about how this is different. I thought this was exactly what I did, but when I experienced it, I learned it's different in these ways. Uh, I was skeptical that it would have more impact, but as I did this, let me tell you about what happened. Real case examples in your selling environment uh, that can help drive that understanding and, and that adoption. Adoption is always the challenge. Same thing with the tools. Uh, handing it over the fence approaches to tools, at least in my experience, uh, can be very unsuccessful. Co-design, co-validation approaches to tools, and then a rollout can be much more successful. Um, comp plans, they change the comp plans. Uh, in the past, goals hadn't been very meaningful. You missed your goal, no big deal. Uh, sorry you missed your goal, try to not miss your goal next year. Um, that wasn't the case anymore, okay? So uh, we now have comp plans with real teeth in them, real variable, tied to an actual goal, and the goal is tied to the actual potential in your territory. Here's the key to goals. Goals should not be set based on the individual. They should be based on the opportunity in that individual's territory. And until they had these potential metrics, they had no way to do that. So that was the enabler that allowed them uh, to get there. Uh, dashboards. It, it is amazing how motivating and powerful dashboards can be. Uh, they went with a pretty heavy hand in this case because they wanted to kind of really kick this sales force into gear. Uh, they've been complacent for some time. And there's always a question on dashboards, uh, if you're going to put them forward, do we go with wall of fame and shame or do we do something lighter? And wall of fame and shame is uh, everybody, it's like a sports team. Everybody's score is going to be listed and rank ordered. And when you come into the regional office that day, you see the 27 people and where you're at in that 27 and what your goal attainment is versus anyone else's. That's the sports team. Pretty motivating because you never, ever want to be on the bottom of that list very long. But it's also a little bit of a heavy hammer. I'd be, I've used it, uh, clients have used it very successfully, but it's also a heavy hammer. It creates a lot of tension. Um, a different way to do it that is a little bit softer is that you only list the top performers. Imagine that you only list the top 20% uh, of performers. Everybody gets to see their name. Uh, so you're, you're motivating them and you're holding up an example of success. But for the bottom performers, all they know is what was their ranking. They don't know what anyone else's ranking was. So you're communicating to that, that to them. By the way, Mike, you're 27 out of 27 again. Uh, if you're there much longer, this is not going to be a good thing. Uh, that kind of idea. Uh, the whole people piece, uh, I think the way that competency models are evolving uh, is really exciting. I think uh, here's the idea for you. Tie your competency model to your sales process. Get away from the idea of generic competency models. Make the competency model highly specific to the sales force. There should be a competency for what does needs assess. You know, if needs assessment is a phase of your sales process, have a needs assessment competency. And describe what that looks like at basic, uh, intermediate, and advanced. Uh, and if you're able to do things like that across the sales process, this, this competency model now becomes impactful. It becomes important. It's directly integrated with what we want people to do and directly integrated with how you would want to review performance and coach. So that was sort of, of the idea. The other part of the idea here was that in the future, we're not going to hold up as our superstars the people who had the highest goal attainment. That's one of the ways you get into the set of being a superstar, but it's not just about getting it done, it's also about doing it right. And so they were looking for individuals that were really exemplifying the competencies, the behaviors and the skills, and getting it done. And now these are the people that we're gonna put up on stage for President's Club. For this organization, they had pretty good impact. Uh, they actually had their two most successful years in the history of the company after they went through this process. And so for them, it was they had 25% uh, growth, but of that 25% growth those two, next two years, 15% of that was because the market was growing. So they would have probably realized that anyway. 13% of that was because of the things they did around Salesforce effectiveness. Um, whether or not you know, that's a percentage that you can realize is, is a consequence of your, your individual circumstances. But I think there are very, very few sales organizations out there that can't significantly improve their growth uh, if they really focus on advancing their sales force effectiveness in the areas that are most directly tied to their key growth opportunities looking forward. Okay, so we just uh, covered uh, basically a year and a half. 
uh, in this case example. Again, my goal was to share with you a picture of what a transformation can look like, recognizing that this comprehensive of transformation isn't something that all of you would go through, but I suspect there are nuggets in here or pieces of it that are relevant to almost all of you. And uh, hopefully there was something there that you were able to pick up. If anybody wants to talk uh, more about this, I will be around for uh, the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.